While grunge music was on its way out by the mid-90s, a new subgenre of rock called post-grunge sprouted up in its final days, and one of those early bands was the British group Bush. Despite selling millions of records, selling out tours, they would be lambasted by critics as being derivative of the bands from Seattle. Today, let's talk about why critics hated Bush, what they had to say about them, and the one rock legend who gave advice to frontman Gavin Rossdale on how to cope with all the hate. Compared to the grunge bands before them, Bush leader Gavin Rossdale had a pretty posh upbringing. Growing up in northwestern London, his father was a doctor who had politically connected patients, some of which were part of the African National Congress. His mother, meanwhile, was a model. Rossdale would attend a prestigious prep school and at one point attempted a career at soccer that was cut short by an injury. His parents would divorce when he was just 11 and he would be raised by his father and aunt. All the members of Bush had older siblings who were teenagers in the late 70s when the punk explosion was at its peak. They would be exposed to groups like The Clash and Sex Pistols, and Rossdale would be a late arrival to actually picking up the guitar, not playing the instrument until he was age 19. He would tell the Chicago Tribune, I left home at 17, was this wandering soul at 19, and decided to become a singer. Very purposeful decision to be the singer, because I wanted to be rich and famous. It was then I decided I wanted to be on a stage, craving the attention of thousands of people. Rossdale would support himself during this time working odd jobs, while playing in a variety of bands, one of which was named Midnight, who actually nabbed a recording contract. But like so many groups, they went nowhere. According to Rossdale, he soon became damaged goods in London, and had to revive his music career by moving to America in 1991. It was during his time in America he lived in California and relied on the kindness of friends and even one ex-girlfriend. It was in November of 91 he was attending a Brian Adams show when he would meet his future bandmate Nigel Pulsford. The pair soon bonded over their love of Pixies and decided to start a band, adding Dave Parsons and drummer Robin Goodridge. The quartet would call themselves Bush, a name which was inspired by Shepherd's Bush, a district in West London. Bush soon recorded a demo and got signed to Hollywood Records. Long story short, they lost the recording contract after one of the bigwigs, who was a huge backer of Bush, died in a helicopter crash. But they would be rescued by Interscope, who put out their debut record, 16 Stone, in December of 1994. The first single was such a massive success that the album, which was due out in early 1995, had its release date moved up a month earlier. It was in the fall of 1994 that LA radio station K-Rock started playing the song Everything Zen, and well, the singles just continued. Machine Head, Come Down, Little Things, and Glycerine. 16 Stone would go on to sell over 6 million copies just in America, and some chalked up the band's success not just to their musical talents, but to their lack of competition. Compared to 1994, 1995 was a fairly light year for alternative rock bands. Despite the success of Bush, critics weren't fans. The band received a lot of comparisons to the groups from Seattle, most notably Nirvana. Rolling Stone even did a whole piece on Bush in 1996 titled Nirvana Wannabes. Bush tried to ignore the comparisons, but you couldn't deny the similarities. Rossdale recalled seeing Nirvana in 1991 when he first moved to America and being so moved by the concert. He dated or at least was friends with Courtney Love at one point. He also dealt with chronic stomach pain like Kurt Cobain and they even shared similar influences and Bush would even work with Nirvana producer Steve Albini on their second record Razorblade Suitcase. Even Nirvana's ex-drummer Dave Grohl saw the similarities and it soon escalated with a short-lived feud between the pair. Grohl apparently wore a shirt with the word Bush on it, but the letter S was replaced with a dollar sign. Rossdale would answer these comparisons telling Spin Magazine, I didn't teach myself to sing in a certain way. You can't manufacture that, you know. That Seattle comparison is really such a lazy one. If you've got loud guitars and the singing isn't screechy high, it's almost inevitable that you will be connected with the bands like Nirvana, who've done so much for music after all. Even radio station program directors pointed out the similarities, with Billboard interviewing the assistant program director from New York's Q104.3 station saying, and I quote, Everyone thinks they're a Seattle band, but they're from England, which makes it even cooler. It wasn't just Bush's music, but Rossdale's good looks that drew the attention of the media as well. It seemed to only further hurt the band's credibility. Rolling Stone in that 1996 profile on the group put a beefcake photo of Rossdale shirtless with the question, why won't anyone take Gavin Rossdale seriously? Bush's camp was so upset with the photo 
that their manager would tell the LA Times that the band had no say in which photo was used for the cover of that issue of Rolling Stone. Their management assumed that the magazine would use a group shot of the band similar to what Spin Magazine did, but Rolling Stone would answer back by saying that no one forced Gavin Rossdale to pose with his shirt off. Rossdale would tell the Chicago Tribune about his weird relationship with the press saying, I'm seen by the press as this dilute little wanker. I should just send a cardboard cutout to sit through interviews, preferably shot in good light to accent the cheekbones everybody likes to write about so much. So who was your typical Bush fan in the mid 90s? Well, the LA Times would publish a profile in 1995 that read, while their appeal to teenage girls would go without question to anyone who isn't blind, the musicians proudly insist that the audiences they draw are about half male. We get an interesting spread of ages as well. Rossdale says, we got flowers from a couple in their 50s the other day with a note saying, hi kids, we thought Zen was a bit vulgar when we first heard it, but then we bought the album and read your lyrics and they were interesting. The press coverage of the band's second record, 1996's Razorblade Suitcase, didn't really get any better, but it shifted a little bit. Yes, there was a lot of comparisons to Nirvana, I mean Steve Albini produced the record, but the press also focused, strangely enough, on Bush's lack of popularity in their home country. New Musical Express, a weekly musical magazine from the UK, would tell the Chicago Tribune, Over here, the big question is, what is America thinking? We've all heard it done better by other bands. The irony is, all those bands are from your country. Rasta would tell the LA Times in 1996, You know, after Smashing Pumpkins put out their first record, Gish, everyone said, hmm, that's interesting. Isn't that Jane's Addiction? Then their breakthrough album, Siamese Dream, came out. And suddenly, they had their own musical island, and they became the purveyors of good taste and the authority on how it should be. Maybe that'll happen to us with our second album. Bush's second album was written against a backdrop of turmoil in Rost's personal life. He had split from his girlfriend of five years. Despite the death of grunge by 1996, radio programmers would laugh off any question about whether the public in America were tiring of Bush, with the program director for Dallas Station KDGE telling Billboard, they're smoking right now. They're one of the hottest acts. I'd like to be their manager. These kinds of projects don't come along very often. While the program director for Boston radio station WBCN would tell the same publication, we've seen no burnout in this band. There's some burnout factors on some of their songs, but not on the band. The sales proved it as Razorblade Suitcase still sold 3 million copies. The intense scrutiny from the press over the years would result in Rossdale starting to feel depressed. He would ask David Bowie one day, how do you deal with it? Bowie would respond, outlive your critics. Rossdale would tell an interviewer, I learned to live with it as a reaction to the success. We were all caught up in the romanticism of that it really did matter. Anyone who's in a band is a needy person that needs validation, singers especially. The band would go on until 2002 before going on a hiatus for the next eight years. Let me know in the comments section what you guys think of Bush and do you guys like their music and do you feel the press comparisons to the grunge bands from Seattle were fair? That does it for today's video guys and we'll see you again in Rock and Roll True Stories.